evening everyone and welcome this is the kingdom series i'm anita i welcome you on tonight as you come on please like and share i see that my sister is already on and locked on good evening to natasha welcome to you love you my sister how are you this evening so guys welcome this is the kingdom series and last week unfortunately this message was supposed to be shared last week but i got a little um last minute emergency and i had to you know just postpone it but here we are today and i'm really really happy and excited to share what god has laid on my heart and tonight we are talking about the kingdom marriage the kingdom marriage Tonight, I'm going to walk you through the book of Genesis, the book of creation, and I'm going to show you the way God created marriage, and I'm going to show you how God intended for marriage to be. You know, right now in the world, we have many, many, many different views about how marriage is supposed to be, and, uh, you know, so many different cultures, so many different ideas of what hi good evening tash yes i know you are always here my beautiful beautiful amazing sister in the lord so tonight we are going to be talking about a kingdom marriage but what is a kingdom marriage the kingdom marriage is the marriage that god ordained it's the way that he intended for marriage to be the way he set it up and tonight i know that people when they usually teach about marriage they teach, you know, that from the book of Corinthians or, or maybe the New Testament, which is great. But I want to show you the foundation of marriage tonight. The way that the Holy Spirit unveiled it to me and gave me step by step and showed me the way that God established marriage, the way he ordained marriage to be and his intention for what this institution or this covenant of marriage is all about as i said you know there's so many different views you know when we talk about marriage immediately you know we have so many different ideas and ideals and you know everybody has an opinion about marriage but tonight we are going to hear what god has to say about marriage what did he create this covenant to be what did he intend to come out of the institution of a man and a woman being joined together in marriage good evening cindy how are you so great to have you on one of my neighbors she's on here tonight so i welcome you great to have you my my beautiful beautiful neighbor cindy so let's get into the message guys let me just pray and then we're going to get into the message. God has been speaking so much to me, you know, so much about his kingdom. And I really want to do my best by the power of the Holy Spirit to bring across what he's saying. Because it's so important for us to understand his, his kingdom, his ideals, what he, you know, intends. Because God's way is the way. There is no other way but God's way. When we do it his way, there is success. When we do it his way, there is success. So let me just open in prayer tonight and then we're going to get into the message. Father, we give you praise. Lord, we give you honor. We give you glory. The name of Jesus, the name above every other name. We lift up your name on high, my Jesus. Father, you are worthy to be praised. I thank you tonight, God, for this opportunity to be able to share your word. I thank you, Lord. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for the revelation and for the wisdom and for the knowledge, God, to, to be able to, to share, Lord, tonight. I thank you, Holy Spirit. Just move me out of the way, Lord. Have your way in this tonight, Lord. We are here to hear from you lord if it's not of you we want we want nothing to do with it father we only want what you have to say and i thank you that the word will be a blessing to every single hearer tonight myself included god and i thank you that we will learn and we will grow and we will be blessed by the word that comes out of your mouth holy spirit so we give you honor and glory in jesus name amen Good night. I see my old neighbor, Avin, is on. 
and it's so great to have you on tonight. You know, they were my neighbors um, in the apartment building that I was living in several years ago, and we, we, you know, we became friends, and we have stayed, you know, good friends, and it's great to know that, hey, you know, you can make connections at every point of your life, and still have, you know, great relationships with wonderful people. I see Leah Mam Chan is watching here tonight. Uh, budding cricketer, budding Trinidad and Tobago player. Welcome on, welcome on board the Kingdom Series tonight. I'm honored, honored, honored to have you all watching. So let's talk about the Kingdom marriage. You know, um, something that God was saying to me. Good night, Sister Allison. You know, something that the Lord was saying to me before we get into the message. I just want to put this in because it's something for us to have in our in the back of our minds. Why we always, why we are listening to messages like these, and not just messages like these, but you know, any time that we are trying to gain knowledge of God and His kingdom, and you know, the Lord was saying to me that it is such an important time for us to be seeking the kingdom, and the reason is that you know, um, the way the world is going. And we see the trajectory that the world is going. And in order for us to remain stable, in order for us to remain steady, in order for us to remain solid in our lives, and even to pass down something stable and pass down a stable foundation for our children, it is so important for us to gain kingdom knowledge. It is important for us to seek the face of God, seek what he's saying, seek his wisdom, learn about the kingdom so that we will benefit. But also, more importantly, what God has been saying is that we really have to try and lay up a foundation for our children because you know many of us have a lot of the information in us already many of us grew up knowing the lord some of us are now in the lord but the the the, the main thing is that and i know many of us on here are parents and we need to make sure especially guys the way we're seeing it with our own eyes, the way the world is going, it's just escalated in a lot of chaos all around us. And if we don't stay stable in the foundation of the kingdom and if we don't pass it down to our children, then our generations to come will be so lost because of the immense pressure that is coming from the world that is obviously of the, the, the devil. The devil is of the world. And he's, all he's trying to do is steal our blessings, steal our generations. You know, right now, if we look, we are seeing what is happening to our young generation. And it's heartbreaking to see, you know, the young generation and what they have become. And I'm saying every one of them, but I'm saying in a general sense, they have lost God. And the, the young generation have lost God. And it's because the parents have not passed down this to their generations. You know, just today I was having a conversation with my husband just this morning, you know, we were having our coffee. And I was saying, you know, the way we are with our daughter now if we had that when we were that age, I told him, I said, we would have been probably ruling the world by now, you know. Not that our parents, um, you know, they tried their best, but a lot of them did not have this same kingdom information to pass on to us. So they didn't know how to teach us how to live as God wanted us to. They didn't teach us how to, you know, kingdom information about kingdom marriage they didn't teach us these things you know and a lot of us some of us were, were privileged some of us were extremely privileged to learn it and implement it and, and many people you know still live out this type of lifestyle but really and truly think about it from the days of our grandparents to now think about how different things are in the world of course, we must become modernized. Of course, things must change over the years. But what needs to remain is the stability and the foundation that is God's kingdom and his way that he wants us to live. Because the more we step away from what God ordained, the more trouble we get ourselves into. The more we step away and we're out of alignment with how he wants things to run, then we are in danger. I'm telling you guys, danger, serious danger. Not just us, but our children. Because if we don't pour, you know, a lot of us, right? 
I'm going to get into the message just now, but I need to say this before because we need to understand how important. Please, guys, like and share the video. Hopefully, somebody else will hear and will take in the message and will, you know, benefit and really try to, you know, think differently. But think about it, right? A lot of us parents, myself included, I always try to tell my daughter about the things that, the ways I went wrong in my life. I always tell her, you know, well, I don't want her to make the same mistakes. How many parents are on here tonight could testify of that? We don't want our kids. We don't want them making the same mistakes that we did. I'm telling you, I, I pray and I pray and I pray and I say, God, please do not let my daughter make the same mistakes that I did. And I always tell her, I'm very open about it. And I tell her, you know, the wrong things and the wrong parts and the, the, the bad decisions that I've made over my life. But... Something that the Holy Spirit was saying to me today, it's all well and good to tell our kids that we don't want them to make those mistakes. But what are we giving them to help them to make better decisions? What are we giving them to help them to make better decisions? And this is where seeking the kingdom and also passing on kingdom knowledge is so very vital. We need to pass on the kingdom information to our next generation that they will take this information they will take it and they will run with it and they too will influence generations to come and to remain stable because guys let me tell you the world is so intent on stealing from us the devil is busy if you look at the media if you look at movies if you look at music in every aspect of life the enemy is trying his best to influence you know, our generations to turn away from God, and including marriage, including the institution of marriage. So tonight we're going to look at what this thing called kingdom marriage, how did God intend marriage to be so that we could implement this in our lives and we could also teach our children by example and by also teaching them the word of how to operate in a marriage and what it's all about. All right, guys, so as I said, like and share. So let's just talk. So I went to the book of Genesis. As I said, I always love to go back to the foundation. Going back to the foundation is so important. You know, my pastor was preaching a message on Saturday and he was saying, you know, give me that old time religion. Give me that old time religion. And, you know, we might cast aside the old timers and say, you know, they don't know about this new generation and the new time. But I'm saying that the old time foundation <laughs> Of, of, of God is still there. It still exists. It's still important. So let's go. So let's talk about marriage. What is marriage? People say marriage is a piece of paper. They say marriage is just a piece of paper. That's, you know, don't even bother. We just shack up and live. Nothing is wrong with coming together and living. But you need something to say that you are bound together as man and wife, right? So marriage is a covenant between a man and a woman. What does covenant mean? Covenant means a relationship between two partners who make binding promises to each other and work together to reach a common goal. I want you to listen to this definition. It's so important. It's the foundation of what marriage is. And I will show you even further how, how, how earthly marriage is also a uh, a replica of God's intention when he created us, the spiritual marriage between God and his people. So let's go. So I'll, again, I'm going to read this for you. Marriage, the covenant, the meaning of covenant, a relationship between two partners, two partners, a man and a woman, a man and a woman, guys, yeah, who make binding promises to each other, and work together to reach a common goal. I see my friend Raja is on here tonight. Welcome. I, you know, I, I don't know what I owe this honor to, to have Raja on here tonight, but I welcome you tonight. Listen, <clears throat> the very first union of two souls, we all know, was in the Garden of Eden. The very first union, the very first marriage took place in the Garden of Eden. But I want to break down the steps of this first marriage. 
I want to show you God's intention for marriage. So we know about Adam and Eve, that they were the first, the man and the woman. Let's look at the steps. Genesis chapter 2. You can take notes of it, of how a kingdom marriage is established. This is something we want to replicate in our lives. It's something that even if we are married, we can make adjustments to suit depending on what's missing. We could also teach our children how to choose a proper spouse. Look at the example of what God did. And we are going to look at how we could teach our children. Or even if you are a single person, you could see how to choose a spouse that is going to give you success in this thing called marriage. Genesis chapter 2 verse 1. Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east in Eden. And there he put the man he had formed. Eden translates paradise or pleasure that's just a rough translation that you know if you if you look up on you know trying to define the word called eden it's very difficult to translate the word eden because of the old hebrew that was used back then but you know they, they, they the translators have done you know the best that they can and they translate it to mean paradise or pleasure something that brings pleasure or paradise so it can be safe to say that if God himself planted this garden, then it would be the closest thing to heaven. Eden was supposed to represent paradise on earth. So it's God's space that he created. So God created the earth, everything in it. But Eden, Eden was God's special place. Do you have a special place? You build your home. You build your home, but I'm sure you have a little special spot in your house that maybe that's your place to go and relax and enjoy. And, you know, maybe you have your plants. Maybe you have whatever it is that you enjoy. Maybe you have just a little spot. I know I have my little spot that I like to go and sit and have my coffee. That's my spot. So it's just like this. God is replicating a part of heaven and earth in the Garden of Eden. And that, you know, we saw that in the book of Genesis, that he, they said God walked about in the garden in the cool of the day. He came and he walked about. This was his way of enjoying his creation. So we know that God himself planted the garden. It's the closest thing to heaven. I'm going somewhere with this, guys. Pay attention. We have something really powerful coming out of this. So we see that in this place, it's where God walked about. His presence was found in the garden. God's presence is found in the garden. And guess where God placed Adam? In the garden. Why? God placed the man, Adam, close to himself in his presence. This is profound. This is something that is going to definitely help you in your life you, you know just pay attention to this so there is eden there is the presence of god god took adam and he put him in the presence this is god's original intention for man to live and dwell in the presence of god god did not take adam and put him anywhere else he put him close to him his presence in a place that he recreated that was just like heaven in you know paradise so what we're seeing here is God starting to establish his divine order in things. First, he creates the space. When we have to get married, we don't not just get married when we, and we don't know where we're going to live. It's something that we really need to be wise about. Many of us do that. Many of us had made the mistakes. I did the same thing. You know, when we got married, we didn't have a place to live. We, we lived with our, with our in-laws. But the reality is that we need to understand, we need to teach our children. Before you could even think about getting married, you need to make sure you establish your place, your home, your Eden. It needs to be there. Men, you know, men work and they establish something that is their own. Even if you don't have a house, at the moment, if you have plans and you have your money saving and you're going to build or you know what you're going to do, all that is good. But it's, it's difficult for a couple to get married and they don't have a place. They don't have an Eden. It's going to cause a lot of problems because, you see, God always works in order. How many of us could testify? Maybe we got married and, you know, we got married um, at a young age and we didn't have anything and we had to work from scratch to build 
how hard and difficult was it? It would have been really difficult. Now, I'm not saying that you can't work together to build, of course, but you must have something in place. This is why, you know, it's important for a man to be able to find his purpose, be able to earn his money, to have something of his own before he gets married. Because if he doesn't have that, he will always be dissatisfied. I'm telling you guys, any men on here can testify to that. Men will never, ever, ever, a man, a, a man, a male, will never be satisfied completely until he has his own. It's because this is how God created them to be. Unless he's walking in his purpose and he's, be, he's able to earn and fulfill that, that, that mandate of being a man. This is why a lot of men are depressed. Can I tell you, this is why so many men are depressed. Many men are depressed because why? They're unemployed, they don't have a job, they don't have money, they don't have a place of their own. And it's hard for them. It's hard. But I'm telling you, if you get a great partner to work together with you, it could happen. But you must have that idea in your head and know that this is what I'm going to work towards. I'm not just going to, you know, wing it. That, you know, some people get married and they're just going to wing it. They don't have any plan in place. And so what are they going to do? So let's get back to what they're teaching here tonight. So the original intention for male, the male species, is to be close to God in his presence. Once you are in a, in the, once, when a man, and I said it before, in the teaching about the kingdom man, if a man is aligned and dwells in God's presence, listen, then, then he's able to be called a candidate for a kingdom husband. And this is where a lot of us falter. Ladies, this is for you tonight. Do, you know, many of us, if, if you have married already, I'm not saying we're going to throw away our husbands. But I'm saying that many of us made an error when we were choosing because we did not choose a kingdom man. Simply put... And, 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 and God can fix that. He can. He can transform that man that you are married to into a kingdom man. But it's going to take work and it's going to take effort and time. And it's going to take being in God's presence to reestablish and to, to restore. It's important. But for those of you ladies who are still single, for those of you ladies who are looking to become a wife, it is important, 100%, if you are going to have a successful marriage, don't, 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 don't look for a man and then hope to build him into a kingdom man. That's, that's a lot of work, you know. You have to choose a, a, a spouse that is aligned and dwelling in God's presence. Ladies, when you are choosing a spouse for the younger generation, for all these young ladies, I'm telling you, you, will, you need to choose a kingdom man to be your husband. When I say a kingdom man, a man who is aligned with God, who is dwelling in God's presence, who knows the Lord, who loves the Lord, and he is focused in the Lord. And then you can say, okay, this is a proper candidate for a kingdom husband. Men, if you are looking to be, good night, Rebecca. Hi, beautiful sister. So great to have you on tonight. Uh, men, this is great for us to hear. If you, uh, you have intentions of becoming a husband, this is where you need to align yourself. Men, it's important. Align yourself with God first. First. Do not attempt to become a husband unless you align with God. And if you already are in your marriage and, 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 and it's, um, it's not too late. Nothing is ever too late with God. Let me tell you something. God is, he's God. He could change anything at any point. So if you're already married and, and you're a man and you're not aligned with the kingdom, so you're not aligned with God, it's not too late. You can. It just simply takes, going to take some effort and spending time with God, getting into the word, learning and growing into, the, into, into becoming this kingdom man. You see, because as I, I'm going to repeat, this vital piece of information in order for a man to know how to treat his wife he needs to understand god first first 
And that's where a lot of problems come in in marriage because the man does not know how God wants him to treat his wife. Similarly, many women don't know how God wants the woman to be to her husband. All of this information is something we need to teach our children, teach our family members, teach the younger generation. Let's spread the word so that a lot of mistakes won't be made. And for those of us who are already in the thing, we can correct the mistakes. God can help us to align ourselves. Nothing, everything can be fixed. God could fix anything. But we have to just be willing to get the information, apply it, and, 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 and partner with God to be able to repair anything that is broken or missing. It's, it's, it's a beautiful thing. Marriage is beautiful, you know, guys. I don't know why, you know, people have so much of bad things to say about marriage. Marriage is a beautiful thing. It's, it's beautiful to have a partner that you could be with and, and, and build with and enjoy your life with. It's a beautiful thing. Now, some people may choose never to get married. That's fine. That's all good. You, there are people who choose to never get married. They just don't see themselves as being a, a spouse. That's okay. God respects. I mean, the apostle Paul, he, he never got married, you know. He said that he chose to remain single because he knew the call in his life was so big. He knew what he was called to do. He knew that he had a lot of, of trials to face in life. You know, the apostle Paul, he knew what trials he had to face to, to spread the gospel. So he chose to remain single. So whatever our decision is that we prayerfully you know, decide, prayerfully decide, it's all good. But this information is for those who want to become a husband or a wife. So I, I we talked about Eden. When you're going to get married, make sure you have an Eden. Or at least you have plans to have an Eden. And you have something in place to have an Eden. You know, and we're just not winging it and saying, okay, maybe we might just live by our in-laws for the rest of our lives. We all know how that turns out, guys. No, no, no. <laughs> So, let's look at the other thing. The Lord God, we're looking at Genesis chapter 2, verse 15. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work and take care of it. God gave Adam his purpose. A man needs to find his purpose before he finds his wife. Why? Yes, important, important, important. A man should find his purpose before he finds a wife. Why? Simply because the woman that you choose will now be aligned with the purpose that God called you to be. Let me give you an example. If you are called, let's just say, if you are called to be a pastor, you're a man. I'm just using an example in ministry. It doesn't have to be ministry. If you are called to be a pastor, you have to know that you have to choose a woman who could stand with you, understand what being a pastor's wife is all about, understand how to stand with you in ministry. She has to have a certain level of, of, of maturity in the spirit. You know, it's different things to be able, because if a man who's supposed to be a pastor and chooses a wife who is of the world, that, that, that's a mismatch. She's not going to be able to help him align with his purpose because she's not going to understand who he is, what he's doing. Similarly, a woman, if you are called to do X, Y, Z, and you pick a man who doesn't know anything about what you, what you are called to do, it's going to cause problems. So we need to be proactive and we need to teach our, teach our children that when they're choosing a mate, first, before they choose somebody to be with, understand your purpose. What are you called to do? What, is, what God put you on this earth for? We need to find that out so that when we do get a spouse, it will, this person will be aligned. God gave Adam his purpose before he gave Adam a wife. Adam had his place to live and Adam had a job to do before he got a wife. And this is important, 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 important. So when you know your purpose, guys, then you could choose a spouse that it will be aligned. Let's move on. Chapter, um, verse 18, Genesis 2. Hear what God's saying. The Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. 
Listen, guys, I want you to pay attention to this. The Lord said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make him. I will make a helper suitable for him. Listen, God chose Adam's spouse. God chose Eve. He made Eve. He created Eve specially for Adam. And he said that she was supposed to, she was going to be a helper that is suitable, comparable to Adam. Listen, guys, we must, when we are choosing a spouse, ask God, pray, please, I'm begging you, pray and ask God to help you choose your kingdom spouse. This is a step that many of us do not follow. Many of us have been guilty of jumping into a relationship for all the wrong reasons. How many are with me? How many of us have been in relationships that we jumped into for all the wrong reasons? Everybody has been through that. We can all testify to it. And because we simply did not consult with God to find out, hey, who is the person you have for me, Lord? <laughs> you know, we must pray and say, God, you know, when everything is ready and you are ready for that time of being married. Good night, Sister Dolly. So great to have you. Good night, John Ray, my beautiful, beautiful, beautiful uh, um, friend, John Ray. She was one of my bosses, Parker Real Estate. So I'm shouting out Parker Real Estate tonight, guys. Listen, one of the best real estate companies in Trinidad and Tobago, a company that is established through integrity, you know, and a foundation of God. So please check out Parker Real Estate when you want your, all your real estate needs met. You can check them out. And um, Sister Beverly, good night to you, my darling. So we are, we are on here with the topic of the kingdom marriage. We are on the point of us consulting God before we choose a spouse. And many of the problems that are in marriage today is because a lot of us chose the wrong spouse. Simple. It might be hard to swallow. It might be a hard pill to swallow. But when I say the wrong spouse, I don't mean that the person, anything is wrong with them, you know. I simply mean that that person was not aligned for you or you are not aligned for them, depending on what the purpose that God called us for. Simply, again, I, I, as I said, I want to bring back to you that example. If you are called to be somebody in ministry, you need to align yourself with somebody who's, who has a mindset for ministry too. If you are called to be an entrepreneur, you need to be in an, an alignment with somebody who can do the same or help you to grow in that mindset, you know, because you're going to be struggling by yourself in the thing. So God chose a helper for Adam. God made Eve. He made, you know, he made Adam to go to sleep. He took a rib and he made Eve especially. And, you know, so I prayed when my, my daughter was little. I remember praying. I said, Lord, you make her spouse for her. Like even now, I, I still pray. I said, Lord, whoever this person is, this is how I pray. I pray in faith. I said, God, whoever the man is that you have chosen to be her husband, you shape him from now, Lord. You mold him and shape him and teach him and grow him from now. So by the time she's ready to get married, he'll be ready. That's the kind of prayers we have to pray for our children. We also have to pray that God will lead them to their right spouse. Don't just leave it. You know, sometimes we just leave it up to our children to choose. And yes, they have to choose. But we have to be prayerful about it. We need to be prayerful about it and say, hey, I want to make sure that I pray. And I also teach my child how to make right choices when it comes to that time of choosing a spouse. Yeah. You know, I would have chosen, made, made bad choices before. I remember, you know, I always talk about that, that. Uh, abusive relationship that I got into. I was fresh out of school, now into my first job, and I just went on, you know, attraction, and I didn't, I didn't even think about finding a man who was after God's heart. All I just wanted to be in a relationship, so I just jumped into the thing, and it was, it, it, it turned into, uh, it turned into trauma, you know. So let's be, let's be purposeful and intentional, and pray. 
pray, say, God, who is the person that you want me to be with? You know? And if it is, as I said, this person is already your spouse, God could change anything. God could change anything. If that person is not aligned with you, God Almighty who created man could change anything. I believe that. So let's move on. So what's the next step with this kingdom marriage? Let's look at verse 22. We are in Genesis chapter 2. So the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man and he brought her to the man. Listen. The Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man and he brought her to the man. You know, the Holy Spirit showed me all these revelations and they were really awesome. This is what God is saying. God brought Eve and presented her to Adam. It's important. God brought Eve and presented her to Adam. Does this sound familiar? Does this sound familiar? How many weddings have we been to? And we see the father walking the daughter, the bride. He's walking her down the aisle. And then they say, who gives this woman to be, you know, who gives this woman in holy matrimony? And the man, the father will say, I do. Listen, we need to understand the spiritual meaning of this. God was Eve's covering. He took Eve and he took and presented her to Adam just like how a father presents a woman in marriage when, it, when, when during the wedding ceremony he gives over the covering that he would have had on his daughter is now given over to the husband we need this very very important to understand a woman's covering and even in the New Testament we see that God had established that they said the head of the Woman is the, the, the man. God is the head of, of, of God is here being the spiritual covering of Eve. He was the first. He was creating her. This is the very first woman. And he transferred, listen, he transferred the covering to Adam. God brought Eve to Adam and he presented her to, to, to Adam and he gave Adam now the, the ability, he transferred that spiritual covering to Adam. Adam now covered Eve. Important. A woman needs a covering. The male figure, he is your covering. This is why fathers are so important in a daughter's life. Oh my God. This is so powerful. A father is the covering of his daughter. Yes, he covers his entire family. But the way God set it up is that women, we are protected. We are covered. We are protected by the men in our lives. So guess what, guys? If a father is absent in a home, the, that's why it's so, that's why girls' lives go astray. Because they don't have that covering. It's, it's something that God established. If God established it, there's nothing that could take it away or break it. So no matter what we do or say, it's there. It's a spiritual uh, a law that's in place and we can't break it. This is why, you know, I talked about it before. But you know, like a woman becomes so broken and traumatized and they go astray in life because they did not have a father. And not just a father, but a father who is after God's heart to cover his daughter. She is covered under her father. And when you, because you don't see it in weddings. Father, um, women don't give away their sons. Fathers don't give away their sons. The, the male is established already as a covering. We need to understand this. This is God's we. This is God's covenant. This is God's established thing. This is, and it's, it's right here. He brought Eve and presented her to Adam. He gave over the covering of the woman to the man. So this is why in the New Testament we see when they establish, when Paul talks about marriage, he said the, the, the spiritual alignment of a household is that there's a man, there's a woman, and then the children come under. Simple. It's easy to understand. When you take away the man, you take away the covering, that's where the family falls apart. It's 
difficult. That's why single mothers struggle so much. Not that they're not doing a good job. They are trying their best, but they were not, they were not made to cover that, to be that strength and protection. And the devil knows this, you know. The devil knows. That's why fathers, it's so important for you to be in your daughter's lives. Also, men need to understand. This is something significant for a man to understand that when you receive a woman in your life as a wife, you are responsible for covering and protecting that woman. God expects it of you. I have a verse, I have a, I have a scripture to read for you and you're going to see the house how serious God takes this responsibility that he places on a man to be a covering over his wife. Very, very serious. God expects, because he is the representation of, you know, I don't want to say the man is God, but he is the representation of the Godhead in the home. When a man becomes a husband, he receives this woman, he is her covering, he is, he, he needs to understand how important it is to cover this woman, protect her with everything that he has in her. Him, sorry. So, guys, let's take this thing seriously. That's why society is the way it is today. Many men have lost their, their, their ability to be a covering. And many of them don't even know that they are supposed to be a covering to their wives. We need to teach our sons. How many of us have sons here? I don't have sons, but I'm saying that you need to teach your sons that are coming up. Hey, sons, when you get a wife, you are responsible for covering her. God established it that way. You have to make sure this woman is protected and take, you have to take care of her. You have to provide for her. You have to be there for her. You have to protect her and her kids and her house. You have to be that covering. It's a big, big, big responsibility that men have. And it's a serious responsibility that they have to really... And God does not take it lightly when a man shuns his responsibility as a husband. I'm going to show you in a bit. I'm going to show you in a bit. It's from the book of, uh, let me tell you what, Malachi, Malachi 2. And I'm going to show you Malachi 2 in a bit, but I want to finish what I'm saying here. That God takes it so serious when a man does not fulfill his spiritual rule as covering of a woman. He's very serious about it. So men, we need to ship, ship up, <laughs> shape up, <laughs> or ship out. <laughs> we need to shape up, men. You need to shape up and understand the responsibility you have as the covering over a woman. That's how God put it in place. And it's either you like it. It, sorry, is that they accept it or not? <laughs> it's so important about it. Let's move on. Then, so let's let's look at the how. So this marriage is taking place. We're looking at the steps. We're looking at how serious this thing is. We are looking at Genesis chapter two, verse twenty-three. Marriage is so serious in the eyes of God, guys. So serious. So serious. The man said. This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. Here we see the uniting, uniting, we see the uniting of Two, two souls becoming one flesh. Let's read that again. This is why a man leaves his father and mother. When you get married, it's no longer about mommy and daddy. It's you and your wife. I'm not saying that we disown our parents. Of course not. We must love our parents. The Bible says we have to honor our mother and father. But when we get married, we need to understand it's not about father and mother, and, and they, they, they don't have an input anymore. It's you and your wife dealing with this thing called marriage now, yes? And they become one flesh. The man and the woman will now join in a covenant, and 
Adam accepted his wife. She's now, he's declaring she's bones of his bones and flesh of his flesh. It's covenant. It's coming together as one for an intention. Man and woman became one flesh. And I want to plug this thing in here. That we need to be so careful about this thing that we, you know, um, you know, people don't understand, and especially in this so-called modern world that we live in, that people think that, you know, having sex before marriage is cool and all kind of, you know, whatever, and we have multiple partners and so, but I don't know if people know, but I'm going to say it here, that this thing called uh, 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 sex is such a powerful spiritual contract that is made between two people that there is something called soul ties. And when you sleep with somebody, you are making a soul tie with them. You are tied. You are becoming one flesh because it's a spiritual contract. Whether you believe it or not, I'm telling you, and this is why so many people have so many problems in life. They don't even realize that the amount of soul ties that they're carrying from things that they, from people that they've been in with their past. And, 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 and we need to teach our children these things. This is something important to teach your kids. Let them know, hey, when you sleep with somebody, you've made a soul tie with them. Your soul is tied to them in the spirit. It's tied to them in the spirit. This is why, you know, Jesus said, if a man puts away his wife, if a man divorces his wife, except for adultery, that they're still married. They're still married because they're one flesh. The act of adultery you know, it, it, it causes a separation with the soul tie. But what I'm saying is that when we sleep with people, we make soul ties. Teach our kids this thing. It's very important. So let's not have a million soul ties and then we're coming to get married because we're bringing all our soul ties into our marriage, right? So with all this, let's look at what God really intended marriage for. Why did God create this thing called marriage? Did he just create it so that man and woman could just join together and just be happy and just hold hands and go to nice dinners together and put on matching pajamas for Christmas and post nice Instagram pictures together? Is that, you know, all of these things are cute and enjoyable in a marriage. But the real foundation of what God created a marriage to be, I want you to look at it. Now, Malachi chapter 2. Let's look at what God really intended marriage to be for. Now here in Malachi chapter 2, God is talking to the children of Israel. And he's bringing judgment on the children of Israel for things that they have done. And here he's saying, Malachi 2 chapter, sorry, verse 13. Chapter 2 verse 13. And this is the second thing you do. You cover the altar of the Lord with tears with weeping and crying, so he, meaning God, does not regard the offering anymore, nor receive it with goodwill from your hands. So what God is saying here, that the, the people were bringing the offering and they were weeping and crying at the altar, but God was not accepting their offerings. Why wasn't he accepting their offerings? Let's read. Yet you say, for what reason? And here is what God is saying. Because the Lord has refused the offering, because the Lord has been witness between you and the wife of your youth with whom you have dealt treacherously, yet she is your companion and your wife by covenant. But did he, God, not make them one, having a remnant of the Spirit? Listen. God is saying in Malachi chapter 2 that he is refusing the offerings of the children of Israel because the men have dealt wrongly with their wives. This He's saying here, you have dealt treacherously with your wives. And this is what I'm saying. Men need to understand that God takes this thing called marriage so serious that he's going to hold men accountable and responsible for mistreating their wives. He will. He will not even accept their offering. He's not going to, because they have dealt treacherously with their wives. And then God is saying, 
Did, did he not make the goddess? Did I not make them one? Why did God make them one? He said it here without any uh, misunderstanding. He said, Malachi chapter 2 verse 15. You can write it down. But did he not make them one, having a remnant of the spirit? And why one? Why did he make them one? He seeks godly offspring. He seeks godly offspring. He seeks godly offspring. Therefore, take heed to your spirit and let none, listen carefully guys, take heed to your spirit and let none deal treacherously with the wife of his youth. For the Lord God of Israel says that he hates divorce, for it covers one's garment with violence. Says the Lord of hosts, take heed to your spirit that you do not deal treacherously. You can take this to the bank because it's the word of God established in the heaven and earth. It's there. Nothing can change it. But what I want to really point out here is what is God saying? Why did he make man and woman one? He seeks godly offspring. He seeks godly offspring. When God created man, when God created Adam and Eve, he gave them the mandate to dominate earth and he gave them the instruction to do what? Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. God brought Adam and Eve together to be able to expand the kingdom of God on earth by creating children by making godly offspring not just any offspring godly offspring because adam and eve their dna was not tainted with sin yet god wanted to spread his seed throughout the earth through adam and eve and this is what god is saying the reason that he puts man and woman together in marriage god wants his kingdom established and expanded through the earth this is something we need to understand and take very seriously because God's intention for marriage is not just about a man and a woman joining together and living happily ever after. He intends for this man and this woman to come together and build kingdom for him through making godly children. God wants us to bear children who will be raised after his own heart he wants us to bear children that would also do the kingdom work on earth and this is a big responsibility where marriage is concerned we need to understand and many for you know over the years we've come to a point where sad to say that marriage has become a very selfish thing the the, the mentality and the view that many of us have of, of marriage is that it's about us and it's about how happy we are. But I want to say to you here that when we got married and we made our choices, that when the children came in the marriage, they didn't have a choice. No, did they? The children did not have a single choice in saying whether they wanted to come into this world or not. So it becomes very selfish of us as humans to come now and say that we want to split up or we want to divorce because we now don't know how to work our thing out and you know a lot of us say um i'm not staying in a marriage because it's just um just for the kids and that's wrong that's so wrong we need to understand that it is important in god's eyes to stay together to raise godly offspring now i'm not saying i'm not talking about anybody who is in a abusive relationship or anybody who is whose life is threatened i'm not talking about that whatsoever that is another case altogether i'm just talking about two human beings who come together and then later on in life you just feel like you're just bored or fed up of this person and you just want to you just want to split you're not happy anymore this person is not fulfilling whatever desire for you anymore or making you happy and you just want to you just want to leave but we have a greater responsibility to think about. And many people say selfishly, I'm not going to stay in this marriage for the children. But the children did not ask to come here. And from the minute that we rip apart their lives, then we are, we, we, we are dishonoring God. 
We are dishonoring God because the children now have to have to face the repercussions of our stupid mistakes, our bad decisions. So it's so important, as I say, from the get-go to make the right decisions so that we don't get into the place where we have, you know, so if we look at it, we look at it. They have some women out there, they have children with about five or six different men and, 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 and they just keep going on the line. These, these poor children, they didn't ask to be in this situation and now they have to face life with all of this baggage on their shoulders. They don't, probably don't know who their father is or they, they, they're struggling financially because the father not supporting them. Every day we, we see somebody struggling with some, some, some father who not supporting financially or whatever. I was a product of that. Our, my father, he never, he never supplied us financially. My mother really struggled. It was a hard life hard life and you know we need to start making better decisions but also we need to as i said you don't just tell your children don't make the mistakes i i made we need to teach them the right way so that they will have a, a, a lot more wisdom when they're choosing they will have a lot more wisdom when they're choosing because god desires godly offspring he wants us to raise children for him he wants to expand his kingdom on the earth. And it's so important, you know, that we raise our children to know God. We raise our children to expand the kingdom. It shouldn't be that, you know, we, we just focus on what we on our growth alone. No. We have to focus and teach, teach, teach. This is something and, and you might find that I'm repeating it. But this is something God has been pressing and pressing and pressing and pounding in my spirit about teaching the next generation teach them about the kingdom teach them about the kingdoms the keys to the kingdom teach them about the wisdom of god and the word because if we don't we're gonna lose them we're gonna lose the generation that is coming many of them have already been lost unfortunately that's the hard part because they, they just I don't know, like I think that the modern um, parents, because they want, I don't know, is it that they just want to be so modern and cool that they just say, you know what, I'm just going to let these children make choices and do what they want. I, I, we, we're seeing it now, huh? We're seeing it now. Parents are letting children, little children, choose things that they, you know, choose gender and whatever. And these are things that, how can a little child, you know, choose something like that? This is something we have to be so mindful of that it's, 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 it's going on right around us. I pray to God that we could really step up and do what we have to do. God said he desires godly offspring. He wants godly offspring. But I just have a few more points I want to point out to you before we finish here tonight. Earthly marriage between man and woman, I'm going to wrap up with this part. Earthly marriage between a man and a woman is a reflection of the spiritual marriage of God and his people. We all know that God referred to, refers to the, the, the body of Christ as his bride. The body of Christ is the bride of Jesus. And, and throughout the Bible, God puts himself in the in the, in the role of husband and when i say husband he puts himself in that same role that he would have given to man to treat his wife that's the same role god put him that's 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 the role he has when it comes to his spiritual bride i'm going to show you how he did it so god the earthly marriage between man and woman is a reflection of the spiritual marriage of god and his people God is in a covenant relationship with his people and it started with Abraham. So I wouldn't get into this tonight because this is a whole different teaching altogether and it might be just too much information in one. So I'm going to wrap up there tonight and next week we are going to get into, I'm going to show you how God made the covenant with Abraham and the points there too that we could implement in our life. Yes? One of them being, one of the first things being God carefully selected Abraham. And if God carefully selected Abraham to be his, to start this covenant with, 
we need to be very careful about who we select to be our person that we're going to make up a covenant with. So guys, I want to wrap up there tonight because time is, is already an hour and next week we're going to continue. But, but I want to say this before we close off. The covenant of marriage is something that God takes so seriously. He said he hates divorce. And you know, if you're divorced, it doesn't mean that God hates you. He hates the idea of divorce because it brings so much trauma and trial to, to lives. Nobody who got divorced probably wanted to be divorced. It's, they didn't probably get into marriage with the intention. But what I'm saying is that God wants us to be so mindful of how serious the covenant of marriage is. It is so serious in the eyes of God. It's something that we take seriously. You know, we have a, a culture, you know, somewhere in Hollywood that if we look, we see people will get married today and then two months down the line, they divorce and then they're going on. And it's not something that we need to be uh, 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 adopting as our culture because that's not God. Well, we get into marriage, you know, you don't get into marriage and say, well, okay, if it doesn't work out, I'll get divorced. That is, that is so wrong. When you get into the thing, you need to understand this is a serious thing. This is for life. This is till death do us part. And whether you like the person or you don't like the person, everybody who is married could say to the people who are not married, that there's not every single day that you like your spouse. There are days when you feel that you could just take something and lick them down with it. <laughs> My husband is right there on the couch. He's hearing me. Listen, it's not every day that you like the person you like the person you're married to, you know. It it no. If anybody could say that they like the person that they're married to every single day, it has days when you seriously question. What did I get myself into on both sides? But my point is that God knows that, you know, it, 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 it's, it's human nature. And he is the person that if we trust him to be the third person in our relationship, that he can hold us together on the days that we can't hold ourselves together as <laughs> Talia. <laughs> yeah. But he knows it. He knows it. He knows it. I tell him that. <laughs> but guys, God knows that it's tough being in a covenant relationship with another human being. And he knows that there would be days when we'd be tried to the utmost of our ability to remain together. But you know, God. He wants to be the one, the day that we don't have strength to hold ourselves together in a marriage, God will hold us together, but we have to trust him. We have to lean into him. We have to make him the center of this marriage. We have to make God the center of the marriage. And if he's the center of the marriage, then the days that we struggle, that he could hold us together. The Holy Spirit could hold us together. And help us to get back on track. Because marriage is tough. It's no better roses. You know, before I got married, and people used to say, marriage is not a better roses, you know. And you know, I was so young and naive. And you laugh at it. It's like, no, but we love. We can be all right. But when you really get into this thing and you realize, all the married people testify and say, amen. It's not a better roses. But it's a beautiful thing. If you do it with God, I've done it without God, and now I'm doing it with God. And I can tell you that with Jesus Christ as the center of your marriage, listen, it's successful. It is. Jesus Christ is the reason that I could stand here today and say that my marriage is a success. It's because of Jesus Christ. As I said, we did it before, before we really knew the Lord. We tried to do it on our own, and it did not work. You know, I, I, it didn't, it didn't. And now I can safely say with 100% certainty, with Jesus Christ as the anchor of my home, my home is a different place altogether. So I want to pray with you guys. I want to pray with you. And then we're going to, you know, head out. And I will see you back here next week. God is so good. He's so great. He's so wonderful. See at the course, you know, um, this morning I put up a post and I got so much response from the post and 
I, I know that it's because, you know, so many of us are going through so much, so much, so much. This is just, the, the, this isn't apart from the message I'm talking about, I talked about tonight with Kingdom Marriage. This is just, a, you know, I, this morning, you know, my prayer time, I was seeking God and I myself was feeling very discouraged and down about certain situations and we all face those every day, don't we? And, you know, I was, I was praying and I said, God, you know, help me, help me, help me here. I feel very, you know, I feel very discouraged about the situation. And as I was praying, you know, that came to me that, hey, you know, Jesus, when he was on the road to Calvary, when he was on the road to Calvary, how tough and difficult it was for him. But what did he do? He just put one foot in front of the other and he just kept pressing because he was walking in his purpose as tough as it was he was walking in his purpose and i want to say to us tonight that many of us are walking in god's purpose and we're seeking god and we're trying to hold on to him and it seems as though every the more we hold on to god sometimes the more troubles and the more pressure and the more discouragement but i want to say to you we have a father that experienced it. He went through it. And even if, just as, you know, let me tie this into the message tonight. Even if you're in a marriage where it's tough, maybe you're not in the place where you need for it to be, remember Jesus. And keep pressing in him. Keep putting one foot in front of the other. Keep praying. Keep seeking God. Keep praying for your husband. Keep praying for your wife. Keep praying for your children and, and just keep pressing on and pressing on and put one foot in front of the other and God is going to do it for you. He's going to work for you. He's going to work for you because you're walking in purpose. You're walking in alignment. You know, some of us, we're trying to put our marriages back together. We're trying to do certain things. We're trying to get our spouses to come in alignment with us. Many, many people, you know, because they, they, they know God in a certain way, they want their spouse to come in alignment with them. Just keep pressing. Put one foot in front of the other. Don't give up. God is able to do it. Just keep pushing, pressing. Because Jesus, none of us have picked a cross up in our backs and walk with it as yet. And if we remember how our father did it, he walked in purpose. Just keep doing it. He will, he will, he will fix the problem. He will bring us back. As long as we keep our eyes fixed on him, as long as we keep pressing in, as long as we keep abiding by the word, I'm telling you, God is, Jesus Christ is going to fix whatever it is and bring you into that place that he, you desire to be in him, in him. So I love you all so much. And let's just close in prayer. Father, we just thank you. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father, we worship you. We just give you praise, Lord. Hallelujah. Your children join together right now just to worship you, Lord. We praise your holy name. You're so wonderful, Jesus. You're so great. Father, we remember tonight. We remember that journey that you took to Calvary, Lord. We remember that cross that you took up. It was for us, Lord. And as hard as it was, you just kept putting one foot in front of the other. So, Father, today I ask that you give us, Lord, the strength to just keep pressing on. For those who are discouraged tonight, for those who feel like they're not seeing the results that they want, Father, I pray tonight you strengthen, strengthen us tonight guide us, lead us. Holy Spirit, help us to, to come in alignment. Help us to understand how you want us to do this for you. Help us, help us to show us the way that we, had to, we are to be every day, Lord. Guide our steps. Lord, your word said that you order our steps. Order our steps every single day as we keep pressing in on you, Lord. And I thank you, God, that as, as, as your children lay their hearts before you, and the prayers and the cries of their heart, Lord, you are here. You have heard us. You have heard us, Lord. You've heard us. And I thank you for the answers. And I thank you for the solutions. And I thank you, God, for who you are and your blessings over our life. In Jesus' name, amen. So good night to you all. I love you all so much. Thanks for joining on. Thanks for sharing. I pray that this blessed you. I know this message blessed me. And... 
I pray that we will continue to grow our children for the Lord, teach them, pour into them, so that the next generation will be running the race with Jesus Christ with fire. <laughs> Love you all guys. Take care and good night.